Hello and welcome to this program on Nurturing Excellence, Teachers of IIT Kharagpur. This is Professor Jayanto Mukhopadhyay, Dean Outreach and Alumni Affairs of this institute. Like before, in this episode, I will be talking to one of my distinguished colleagues, a very young colleague of mine, Professor Partho Sharathi Chakrabutti. Partho is a internationally renowned marine geochemist. His work on understanding the interaction between metal, metal ion and natural ligands has facilitated to our understanding of the environment, how the metal deposits in the marine life is disturbing this ecosystem that has been elaborated by his work further. So his mission is to preserve the marine ecosystem and have a healthy environment, sustain a healthy environment of this earth. Partho did his graduation from North Bengal University, Shiliguri, in chemistry with honors in 1998. He also did masters in inorganic chemistry in 2000. And then he did his MTech in Cochin University of Science and Technology in 2002. After that, he moved to Canada and from Carleton University, he obtained his PhD degree in analytical chemistry for environment. Then he did his postdoctoral in the Netherlands. And in 2008, he came back to India. He joined National Institute of Oceanography, where he did his pioneering work on understanding the process of metal traces in our, in the sediments of the sea uh, and also in the marine ecosystem. He received the MS Krishnan medal from Indian Geophysical Union in 2015. In 2017, he received IAGC Kharaka Award USA. In 2018, Partho received Shanti Sharu Bhatnagar Prize from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, India. So let us listen to his work and life. So Partho, thank you for joining this program. Thank you, thank you so much. So just, you know, I was just uh, looking at your particularly CV and I could see that from a very modest academic environment background, you just reached at the you know, top of your domain. It's a very wonderful fit. So, how did you accomplish this? Uh, uh, frankly speaking, I'm from a very small town, uh, from Siliguri. My parents were teachers. And uh, so, the academic environment was always there. Uh, so, basically, I initially I wanted to be a cricket player, then musician. And then by seeing my brother, I thought that I should also study. And uh, then uh, chemistry was always a passion for me. And uh, I always wanted to be a very good, you know, uh, renowned chemist, like what we used to read in our textbook. And then slowly started pursuing career in chemistry. And, and these things happen, like, you know, it's, it's not that I did it uh, purposefully, but it just came on its own way. So, I, but I, what I feel that two things are very important. One is uh, we need to think out of the box. Means I cannot do anything. We cannot really achieve anything from our comfort zone, and uh, we need to come out from comfort zone and work something what we want to do. And uh, and and second thing is. Uh, 
uh, we should not be very uh, biased like you know if i want to do something uh, if that is not happening that is not the end of the life um, but uh, if we can still pursue uh, wherever i want to uh, you know uh, whatever i want to achieve i think it is possible to uh, do good work and recognition and all these things come automatically if there are many much better scientists than me and uh, and still they don't bother about all this recognition so i think this recognition is something uh, every year everyone is in at least one or two people are getting if it is ssb or national geoscience but that is not the end of the things end of the uh, you know that it means i don't believe in uh, defining uh, somebody's achievement based on these awards but uh, yeah definitely i love to do chemistry and uh, chemistry of environment as well as in marine system and um, and try to understand some of the new things some microscopic processes that are taking place in nature so uh, uh, which is new at least in this area and not much work has been done and some of the works are quite new uh, even in the world so i think um, uh, that gives lots more lot more happiness uh, and uh, and during this process many things come like achievements and all these things awards and those things automatically come yeah i agree so so how do you choose this area uh, uh i if you, you you must have seen that uh, i'm from a chemistry background completely chem- means pure chemistry i did msc in chemistry in organic chemistry then i did uh, uh, mtech in applied chemistry and then phd in analytical chemistry but um, all these means whatever the process you look at in on earth everything is governed by chemistry and and if someone knows chemistry he can understand different processes uh, or the mechanism in a much better way so during my phd i learned analytical chemistry and uh, i was working with fresh water and uh, lake water uh, system and uh, which is completely different from marine system and um, then after coming back to india uh, after my phd when i and post doc when i came back to india then i started uh, initially i thought that i'll be working on water column because i was trained in that and uh, eventually what happens the environment and the, the 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 infrastructure that i needed was not available so i decided that uh, mm, i should uh, come out from my comfort zone and start doing something and um, then whatever the understanding i had so i started reading uh, and uh, trying was trying to develop something new in uh, in 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 another field and um, so whatever the infrastructure i had with that i started working with sediments where you know uh, i could generate at least some useful data and uh, and from there uh, you know i started working on uh, sediment chemistry uh, particularly on the microscopic processes not the macroscopic processes because these microscopic processes basically control so this, this is a sediment uh, in the river under the river no and in in estuaries as well as in the coastal sediments and the shelf areas as well as in the estuarine sediments so i initially i started like, working you know, on call that. that beach area where the sandy beach area or uh, sandy clay no you have to go a little maybe 30 meters depth uh, of the water know, zero to yeah yeah underneath the water but now i work on the deep sea sediment as well deep sea sediment as well as in the water column in iit kharagpur i established the facilities and uh, during this pandemic i did it uh, because no students were there and uh, during that time i could manage to establish so how, how the how do you collect those material from the uh, uh deep sea we, we we go uh, by ship and uh, from there uh, we have uh, uh you know uh, piston corer 
and through which uh, we can collect our box scorer. Uh, what is that you are saying? Box? Piston scorer or box scorer. Box scorer. So yeah. digging the thing. Yes, it goes five kilometers down and it collect. Uh, so it's sediment. a it's a automated uh, like some that kind we can of control motor, from motor, ship. Motor, motor, uh, we operator. can control from ship. Okay. Yes. Mm. And uh, also the what in water column also we can automatically we can control the water sampler and uh, that we can um, you know collect samples from different water depth depending upon our requirement and uh, we can preserve we need to preserve them uh, uh, properly and then bring them to the lab and do the analysis yeah so please continue your research on sediment and yes so then i uh, because sediment usually contains higher concentration of uh, metals since uh, i work on trace metals the concentration of trace metals in sediments are more than in water column much more means if something is in say in milligram per li uh, milligram per kg some elements which are present in milligram per kg in sediment uh, that is present in uh, you know in nanomolar uh, range in water column which is much 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 smaller so if you is, is, is there any kind of you know, good uh, sound robust relationships mathem quantitative relationships mm, those quantitative relationships like, no, my point is that just from the sediment analysis can you predict uh, mm, what is there in the water column right uh, uh, now the thing is uh, now which part of water column you are looking at that is very important say if you are going to central indian ocean where the depth is uh, you know say around 5 uh, kilometers so definitely you will not have any relations with sediment and uh, the topmost water column but if you just look at the overlying water column sometimes you may get a positive relationship which means near the beach no. near the coastal beach or no no i'm talking about uh, in even in coastal uh, areas as well as in estuary you may get positive relationship if there is a source of a particular metal from sediment say if there is a positive flux positive benthic uh, positive uh, flux of metals from sediment to water column then they will be in a steady state not in equilibrium but in a steady state so in that case you may see a relationship exist between sediment concentration or pore water concentration and bottom uh, so which means you are saying that the, the interactions uh, between the sediment and also the water yes Some but it is not always true it is not always true you may not get any relationship you may not get any relationship even you may get negative relationship also if there is a negative benthic flux that means what from it, water dissolved metals are getting adsorbed on on surface sediments bottom sediments so in that case concentration of sediments will go up concentration okay. of water column let will me go down this question another way very hmm. layman's style hmm. so suppose i don't get any metal trace in my sediment hmm. does it mean that metal trace is not there in the water trace metal trace hmm. metal uh, or any metals you will get in some quantity in sediment so it will not be zero but you can like if it is very low so whether it means low concentration in water column yeah right that mm -hmm. is your question uh, it see uh, here the aqueous environmental geochemistry and source of those sediment plays very important role the sediments basically are came from rock right because of weathering of rock those rocks you know form those small particles and then they move along with the river finer particles they got deposited or you know coarser or sand silt clay all of this got you know uh, sedimented in river or in estuaries or in coastal areas now if rock contains high concentration of metals then definitely you will get high concentration of metals in sediment and those metals are, will not come to water co water column because they are within the structure of the sediment but if the source rock contains low concentration then you may get low concentration in your sediment and that low concentration also will not come into the water column so even if you have uh, you know low concentration in water column that never indicates that you will 
have low concentration so, in sediment. So, just to summarize, mm. that means uh, in the sediment you get every possible metal traces. Almost. So, yes. there is no way of excluding some metal which is not there in sediment means it is not also there in water. No, 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 it's difficult. It, it is it's very difficult. So, very you cannot difficult. really make any conclusive uh, no, evidence no, just no. for sediment analysis. No. You have to really go for we the water to. column analysis yes. for that. Okay. Yes. Please yes. continue. Yes. 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 So, then uh, I started working on sediments because the concentration uh, are generally high than water column and started working on sediments um, and trying to and was trying to understand how metal chemistry influences their uh, speciation in sediments and uh, so the, this speciation yeah can you little bit yes. elaborate this uh, term the speciation is basically identification of species and uh, that is the inorganic inorganic, inorganic substance and organic Organic, Anything, but yes. not the living being species. Uh, no, it's not. It's, this chemical speciation is different from biological species. Biology, there is another definition for biologist. Biologist speciation they define in a different way. But this is chemical speciation where we identify a chemical species, like say mercury so, so and methyl mercury. There is no DNA working. No, no, <laughs> in no, this process. no, no. Right. So here, uh, basically, uh, say. If you are uh, determining total mercury, it's a toxic element, toxic metals. And you know, if you look at total mercury in sediment or in water column, that doesn't give you any information about how much methyl mercury present in the system. And methyl mercury is highly toxic, it's a neurotoxin. So as a chemist, I try to look at how much methyl mercury is present. So identification of this methyl mercury. Can, can you give some example that you know, how it affects our life? Uh, in that case, you know, speciation chemistry basically started. Uh, it's a very new branch of chemistry, and uh, it started around say 60 years, 55 to 60 years back, which is uh, quite new relative to other, other branches. Areas. Yeah, and. Um, it was started after Second World War. During Second World War in Japan, um, they, uh, one company called Chiso, uh, private limited, they established a, a two production house. They were they were producing um, acetaldehyde, acetic acid kind of materials, and at that time they were using uh, mercury as a raw material and they established two uh, manufacturing uh, uh, set up in Niigata and Minamata in two bays and Minamata was a fishing port as well. So what they used to do, they used to um, produce lots of uh, means, you know, acetic acid, glacial acetic acids and uh, acetaldehyde kind of materials and they were using uh, mercury as a catalyst. and. Uh, after the use, they used to dump those mercury in those bay areas. And uh, after five, six years, they found that uh, mercury uh, means, you know, their domestic cats and uh, those, they were having some peculiar behavior. Uh, saliva was dripping from their mouth and then, and they were going very close to water in the sea areas and they used to commit suicide. And uh, initially, people mm, didn't pay much attention to it, but slowly they started uh, thinking about it and they named it uh, cat suicide disease. But after another five, ten, five to seven years, uh, the population residing in that area, they started having serious neurological problem and they had no clue. And uh, what they found that uh, those, uh, it took almost like 20 years to identify that what, whatever the mercury which was dumped by Chiso Private Limited, they got converted to methyl mercury by different bacteria, like sulfate reducing bacteria or iron reducing bacteria. They converted those mercury to methyl mercury and that got bioaccumulated. And since uh, Japanese, they usually uh, eat half cooked or raw. Uh, fish Fishes. and uh, shells and those um, uh, marine uh, foods. So, what happened? They got exposed to this methyl mercury, and methyl mercury is a highly neurotoxic. It's a highly uh, toxic, 
and uh, it's a well known neurotoxin so then scientists started realizing that it is not the total metal it is the form of the metal which is responsible so there is a speciation that is methyl mercury is a speciation of uh, methyl mercury yes so when we are doing speciation means we are identifying some species in nature whenever we keep something uh, you know it starts reacting with many natural ligands like negatively charged anions present or you know or and during this process they produce some different compounds which is a, which has completely different uh, chemical reactivity uh, bioavailability mobility etc so do you, so identification of those species is very important and if we can identify then only we can tell about the fate of those species so you have identified many such you know speciations yes, uh, in your work E, yes means these are the challenges like you know identification of a specific species is very difficult like methyl mercury i have identified we have been doing that and it is not how many species i have identified it is to understand the processes because earth science processes okay. is so complex that we i use this speciation as a tool to understand different processes in a system so it's a kind of validation not of your validation we we what we are doing say uh, in sediment we have lots of iron and all iron are in oxidation state 3 that means they are insoluble they are uh, you know quite stable say ferric hydroxide iron is in 3 oxidation state now when you bring when the surface sediments come to an anoxic water column that means low oxygen environment reducing environment then this iron 3 gets converted to iron 2 which is soluble so when i'm looking at speciation of iron then we can talk about the redox condition of the water column or in sediments when you are going down the the oxygen level in sediments goes down as well right when you are going inside the sediment the oxygen level or the environment becomes more reducing and when it becomes more reducing uh, you know the different microbes they convert this iron 3 to iron 2 manganese 4 to manganese 2 like this so i don't work on microbes what i what i work is metal so i try to understand the oxidation state of these metals i try to understand the uh, you know uh, the in which form it is associated with uh, what kind of natural ligands and understanding all these processes i put together and try to understand what kind of processes are taking place in a particular area yeah but for that uh, you need to also validate because you no know, if you have for example through your understanding analytically you considered that these are the kind of traces possible traces will be there and maybe you no know, those are not yet found and uh, you can you can get them and you can show that no this is this is true uh in that case there are like you know if you there are several certified reference materials so uh, you are saying already it is there and certified reference materials are available okay so when you whatever the process because all these things whatever we do on lab in lab they are basically operationally defined that means very it controlled. may be very close to nature but not exactly what is there in nature right even the ph we talk about ph right but P, when we measure or determine ph we determine ph based on what we determine ph based on buffer we calibrate our ph meter by using buffer so ph 4 ph 7 ph 10 with respect to this buffer we are measuring the ph of yes. our unknown sample right so this is operationally defined similarly these processes whatever the speciation processes that we carry out except water column um, these are more or less operationally defined so tell us some of your you no know, fundamental contributions in this regard of understanding these processes right. uh, analyzing the processes so here the the natural ligands like uh, humic substances like uh, you know when uh, plants on land die then we see uh, they their leaves turns from green 
to br yellow to brown and then they become brittle and then slowly they become integral part of soil. Similarly, the whole uh, tree or whole tree slowly get decomposed by different microbes and then they become integral part of uh, soil. And during this process, microbial degradation, the organic matters in tree or any living organisms, they get partially decomposed. They are not fully decomposed. So a lot of the organic matters become an integral part of soil. The same thing happened even in ocean too, because phytoplanktons, when they die, they settle down and microbes, you know, chew them to get energy. And um, during that time also, they get partially decomposed. Now, they produce lots of natural ligands means this partially decomposed organic matters having lots of negative sites, negative binding sites. So they uh, capture metal They ions. capture positive cation, exactly. So they capture these metals and uh, they play a very important role in controlling metal speciation. So in this case, uh, uh, what I did, I tried to understand the process. The, the structure of this organic matter is not known. The, 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 the complexity of these organic matters uh, is really very high. So I tried to understand how these organic matters controls metal speciation in, in, in our marine sediments. Particularly, um, we are the second highest producer of atmospheric mercury. And also there are many chloralkali plants where, you know, mercury are produced. It's used to produce, now new technology has come up. So all this mercury uh, might have been dumped somewhere. You know, they are getting released and they are getting deposited somewhere. Now, when you look at, when I looked at the concentration of mercury around India in the shelf sediments, the concentration was not really high. And I had no clue because we were expecting high concentration of mercury because we produce so much of concentration of mercury. And uh, then I started. So, looking. so how do you standardize it? Because now every every country, every you know, areas, countries, they are having industry. And so, how do you say that we produce so much of mercury? Because it's, the, it's, in, it's in the report. It's in UNEPA report okay. that we are the second highest producer after China. So, uh, but because uh, of the or, chemical plants and it's basically from thermal power plants, thermal power because plants. Uh, they use lots of coal because we are one of the, uh, you know, fastest growing major economy in, uh, in the world and we need lots of energy. Our energy requirement is really high. And um, so through atmosphere, it gets deposited. Yes. Through rain or something like that. Uh, yes. At elemental mercury can travel even uh, across the boundaries. It can travel far. Uh, away from the point source and uh, but when they react with particulate matter they due to gravity they come down and uh, but I was talking something uh, huh. so then when I looked at low mercury concentration around India so then I started thinking how these organic matters playing role in that then how, which process, complexation process or reduction process. If you reduce mercury, it can go from oxidation state 2 to oxidation state 0, if you reduce it. So if that happens, elemental mercury can go back. Elemental mercury is basically volatile. So reduction can play a very important role in sediments and that can send back all this mercury again to the atmosphere. So I tried to understand how these natural ligands, I just gave an example with mercury, but I tried to understand how these, these natural ligands control uh, mobility and bioavailability of these metals and how it is, um, uh, you know, how it reduces toxicity or how it increases toxicity in marine environment. Because ultimately we are, uh, we will be affected. Like what happened in Minamata, uh, may not be in that extent, but you know, if we get exposed to say lead every day, uh, may not be a very good thing for us. So I, I try to understand how these natural ligands play role in controlling mobility, bioavailability of these different toxic and trace elements in marine systems, particularly now, you, in sediments. You said that now you, this structure is so complex, 
that no, you don't uh, go for analyzing the structure, as I understand. We do, but it is very difficult to, uh, you know, provide a structure with molecular formula and number of binding sites. Number of binding sites also we can. So, is it a provide. statistical approach? No, hmm. we do experimentally, like you know, spectrophotometrically. You can you can get lots of information about the structure. You may not understand the full structure. Even by NMR, we cannot really do uh, or elucidate the real structure of humic substances. Uh, we do uh, FTIR, infrared spectroscopy. We do UV visible spectroscopy. We do potentiometric titration to understand how many carboxylic group, phenolic OH group, or different binding sites present in a system, how much sulfur is present, how much nitrogen is present, because they are also binding sites. So, we, so, so we this, get, is, this is kind of empirical study. No, we do experimentally. We get these numbers huh. and then we do experiment to understand the thermodynamic property. So, it's the analytical part. Yes, that is analytical part where we try to understand how, what is the thermodynamic, thermodynamic stability, how is this conditional stability constant of a particular complex. Uh, because if stability is more, then chances of becoming bioavailable is less. So, the metal will remain intact or locked with these natural ligands for a long time. So, bioaccumulation we can expect less. Uh, but I, uh, in IIT Kharagpur, I established this uh, facility, which is, and if you look at the literature, uh, not even a single data, single paper you can, uh, you can get on uh, dissolved metal speciation. And I established that in uh, Coral, and uh, and I feel very happy for that. And uh, and uh, we already generated uh, a good set of data from Kerala. Vemanad Lake, it's a Ramsar site, hmm. and uh, uh, on dissolved metal speciation, uh, this project was supported by the Ministry of Art Sciences. And um, we generated a very good sub set of data, and hopefully we'll publish it very soon. So, uh, since no, you, you said that no, you, you came back to India and you worked in National Institute of Oceanography, so, first question would be that, why did you come back to India? Right, this was the first question when I entered into the interview book too, <laughs> that why did I come here? You know, in one, one I mean, so why, um, what, IIT Kharagpur uh, is, uh, um, is an institute of eminence. Right, so we no, always. Patu, I will come to IIT Kharagpur later. First question was that why did you join National Institute of no, Oceanography? See, the passion is something different. It means if I tell you very bluntly, uh, whenever I travel during my MTech or uh, during my treatment, whenever I I visited uh, towards south, I crossed means uh, Kharagpur so station. So your hometown is Shiliguri still. Right. Okay. Right. And uh, whenever I travel uh, through this station, uh, uh, from childhood I learned that this is the longest station. And second thing is IIT Kharagpur uh, located in this place. So you can't believe I was literally thinking that all the people even uh, in that station uh, must be knowing very good chemistry, physics and mathematics. So, uh, so, so definitely, you know, I had, uh, I uh, always uh, uh, passionate about uh, to get a, get an opportunity to be a part of this great institute. So it is always there, and uh, and uh, and I feel very happy that I could manage to come here. It means you know, at least now we, we we are fortunate that you no know, such a. A wonderful scientist joined us and doing excellent work. Developed such a laboratory. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. And but 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 the thing is, uh, when but this answer was not there when yeah. uh, I was asked in the interview board. Okay. Um, the basic reason. That, so that is one reason. That was one reason. But it is not the end. It means you know, uh, in CSIR lab, any CSIR lab, if you look at, uh, they have their own mandate. Um, they have their own mandate, like in National Institute Oceanography, the mandate was that we have to, we always need to work on ocean. We cannot do anything beyond ocean. Mm -hmm. And even though I work on metal speciation or chemical speciation, 
but I use this chemical speciation as a tool to understand biogeochemical cycling of an element. So when we are looking at biogeochemical cycling, you need to understand lithosphere, you need to understand hydrosphere, you need to understand biosphere. Then only you can look at holistically. Okay, so I... So this mandate is a bit restrictive in yourself. Yes, It right. is just for ocean water. Yes, That's what you were saying. Yes. So, so, so I even not the sediment. Sediment, marine sediment is fine. Marine, marine sediment, sediment is. is fine, even estuary is fine. But uh, I wanted to... Still I want, because still not completed. So, um, uh, holistically I want to look at how elements move from one sphere to another sphere. So at that time, at that time we cannot really exclude land. Or what, I mean, what is the purpose of doing all this work? The purpose is only thing that there, is, there has to be a sustainable development. And second thing, all of us should remain healthy. And that we really cannot do without holistic study. So by looking at the name Coral, Center for Ocean, River, Atmospheric and Land Sciences, um, I felt that this is probably the best place where I can grow much beyond um, CSIRNIO. Uh, but CSIRNIO, I learned many things there and I established lab there too and generated very good quality data. But I think in IIT Kharagpur, I came here just to explore the other sphere, like lithosphere as well as, uh, you know, biosphere. So if I can combine all these three, probably that will give much more uh, holistic uh, result and more uh, meaningful yeah. result. So, so that is your mission in IIT Kharagpur, just to have that holistic study yes. of the environmental, you know, process of yes. this kind of metal yes. tracing. And, and, and during wonderful. this process, um, uh, um, I got the support from IIT Kharagpur to establish the lab. So, trace metal, marine trace metal biogeochemistry lab, uh, I established in Koral. This, this must be a very unique lab in our it's, country. It's, it is a unique lab. Uh, it is a unique lab. It, in is, our it is quite different from the lab what you have used to work in CSIR. Uh, Yes, uh, mm, but here, you know, things are put together in one place. So, uh, most of the things, even though means the basic requirement and some sophisticated instruments, I put it in such a way that one person, if uh, one person wants to work or understand speciation in a particular area, then so it is possible. You are saying that there was a CSIR, there is a facility, but it was distributed facility. Uh, Coordination was a issue. But, but, but facility wise, yes, facility wise means we also have distribution. Like, you know, there are many facilities in many, like we have central research facilities here and uh, in CSIR and IO also we have, but in, in, in metal, trace metal by geochemistry lab, we have some uh, you know, uh, facilities that we developed and the instrumentations which are unique and uh, required for speciation studies. Uh, but it is not only the instruments which can solve our purpose because we do lots of chemical processing which is much more important. So those are the facilities that I developed here and very much required for speciation studies, which you may not get anywhere. Yeah, so uh, it, no, really as I was telling you that you know, your joining of IIT Kharagpur has added a different dimension in our institute, started a new directions through your research and particularly uh, the center which was meant for this kind of interdisciplinary study. I think, I think it, it was a very uh, good you know, addition by your contributions and I'm sure that we are looking forward more and more work from this. Thank you. I now, will. now, just to you know, come to a bit different, you know, socially relevant questions from your expertise. Uh, so, what is your reading about this climate change, and what what is going to happen, and what it is what is happening? Uh, yeah, climate change has already started. If you uh, you know that everyone knows, and uh, and that uh, basically uh, due to human activities. Because of anthropogenic activities, these things are happening. And now, you know, global warming, ocean acidification, 
and uh, then uh, sea level rise all these things you know uh, people have been talking and they are trying to generate data and try to publish this data and uh, this is uh, definitely a big problem and you know this ocean acidification it is basically we are having more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere so partial pressure has gone up so dissolution of so ph level is going going down, down right and this can have adverse effect on the delicate balance of a trace metals which means they don't know which means you know they can be toxic they can be nutrient now it depends upon the speciation now this change in ph can destroy this delicate balance and if it happens then bioavailability may go up and it can have adverse effect on phytoplankton so did, did you have any study regarding that uh, there must be study going on uh, ocean acidification and metal speciation uh, there are very very few studies you know the reason is the change in ph by dissolving carbon dioxide from atmosphere is very very small and that is happening you know very slowly in indicator time scale if you look at then you will see uh, maybe 0 0.1 0 0.2 ph change in ph which is which is really really low to understand its effect on metal speciation because our analytical system is not that good to understand this change and i am also sure the those phytoplanktons which are present in estuary or in coastal areas you know they are adapted to this ph change this small changes because the amount of acid rain they receive the amount of land but, runoff but there must be an increasing trend of change of ph uh it is there it so, is so there. so suppose no we can but, but get the increasing know, trend and we can project that what is going to happen after 50 years uh such kind of things um, uh, you know many people try to do but you know those are I, I don't believe those numbers number number one because you 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 are just considering one variable ph and based on that ph you are considering your all natural ligands will remain same because you really don't know after 50 years what would be the real structure how this organic matter will react or you know with metals so ph cannot be just one variable there are many variables and also um, uh, the phytoplankton are quite smart people you know plankton they they uh, they also evolve. they can they can also adopt this change in ph they evolve right only problem is there are many calcareous uh, phytoplanktons which may uh, you know uh, uh, dissolve their shell structure like there it is made by calcium carbonate so decreasing ph can uh, uh, release carbon dioxide from their calcium carbonate shell may become thinner their survival may be uh, so you will have more and more carbon dioxide in atmosphere uh, so that process of you know, absorbing carbon dioxide and then again releasing so so, so here, ph level will so go high but uh, in carbon dioxide will be yes so in that case you know um, even though i was not associated with the same uh, uh, experiment or same project but I know and I am producing some material. I'll come into that. Uh, um, it's basically in, if you look at in ocean, world ocean, in the world ocean, there are many places where uh, phytoplankton, those tiny plants on the surface are really, really uh, low. Some places you get some patches and, uh, and it is because all nutrients are present there except iron iron is a micronutrient and that helps phytoplankton to bloom so some places where iron is very deficient like south southern ocean uh, if you go to southern ocean there are patches you know phytoplankton is really low but nutrient concentration is very high those regions are called high nutrient low chlorophyll region what scientists are thinking that if you can give iron in those regions, then phytoplankton will bloom. And if phytoplankton blooms, it will, you know, uh, carry out photosynthesis. 
and if it carries out photosynthesis carbon it will car sequest carbon Sink dioxide carbon and yeah. equal amount of oxygen will be liberated so by adding iron you can sequest carbon dioxide and uh, but in reduce what scale this effect will be there will it be uh, in, a, in a major it, scale or just uh, it is uh, see quantification uh, has not been done because even executing this experiment was a big challenge I think three, I think five or six expedition has been taken place to understand these processes. Even uh, off Oman coast, um, there is a high nutrient, low chlorophyll region. Iron deficiency is there. If you add iron, then you see more phytoplankton bloom, more chlorophyll, uh, which is a positive thing, and um, and that can uh, sequest carbon dioxide. But in what scale it can help in reducing carbon dioxide is definitely a big question. I really don't know. But um, uh, if we can do that, uh, that probably at least something will will be, will be better but than nothing. Say, as a geochemist or mm. overall, so what is the best measure we should take for reducing uh, not only you know, carbon dioxide, the methane, and what about mercury? Because you are saying mercury concentration is going to be then higher and higher because of those uh, concepts of you see now some something uh, thermal power plants. Not only thermal power plant. You are saying some redox process by which you no. Know, right, uh, right. Climate change. Climate change is basically uh, global warming is taking place now. Global warming means degassing will take place in water column. Now, if degassing is taking place, means your oxygen dissolved oxygen will go out. Hmm. So, low oxygen environment. Will extend. Yeah. So now it, it will be. It will. It will become more and more. And under low oxygen environment, there is a chance that methyl mercury formation will be more. And if that happen, uh, then that will not be a good thing. So to reduce this uh, uh, global means, you know, emission of carbon dioxide uh, is basically in our hand. That is in our hand. That is in our hand. We have to be, means still, means we have already damaged uh, quite a bit. Uh, but still we can reduce many things. Even small things can help us uh, reducing uh, this carbon dioxide emission. Like, you know, sometimes we go out from our office, but still fan is on, computer is on, or at home, TV is on, um, and we slept. And, uh, you know, kids are also doing the same thing. So if we can turn off, because this fan is not only few units of electricity. That electricity has been generated in thermal power plants by burning coal. And coal contains high concentration of mercury as well as sulfur. So all the sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, mercury, uh, get carbon dioxide get, re get released to produce that one unit of electricity. So if we can turn off this fan here, that will basically, you know, stop, um, that will reduce carbon dioxide emission in thermal power plants. So everyone, general public, if they start doing it, this is one, then carbon dioxide emission may reduce drastically. Second thing is um, vehicle, everybody needs vehicle, nobody wants to share, that is another thing. But bicycling is one of the best thing. That is another beautiful thing I see in campus. Like, you know, everybody riding bicycle. So that reduce quite a good amount of, you know, uh, reduce fossil fuel burning and emission of carbon dioxide. Uh, secondly, um, if you go to small towns or villages or even in DBC or uh, if, uh, close to um, this side, uh, that Prem Bajar gate, if you go straight on that side, you will see in a small village, people, Everybody brings their domestic, like you know, whatever they get, kura and all these things, they burn. fire it, they burnt it. And that produces huge amount of carbon dioxide. And so those things need to be stopped. And on the top of that, we had COVID worldwide. We were thinking of reducing plastic pollution. Now the plastic pollution will go up several hundred times because um, of this single-use plastic, mask, mask gloves, yeah. apron, everything that we used only once for two years. And as a result, uh, you know, uh, we really don't know how the solid waste management will work on those material. And if those microplastic forms and end up in, into the ocean, 
uh, then that will be so another you, thing. Yeah, you, you did some work in microplastics. You I, were just mentioning. I, so I, you means I, it, it is it is a very interesting uh, research field. The interaction of metals with microplastic is not known, and this microplastic can play a very important role in pre-concentrating persistent organic pollutant as well as these dissolved metals because they form biofilm on their top. If you keep a microplastic, if you keep a plastic in, in water, you will see in this tropical environment, it becomes uh, slimy on the surface. And uh, that is nothing but biofilm. And this biofilm contains lots of metal binding ligands, natural ligands. So they can also preconcentrate many persistent organic pollutant as well as different metals on their surface. And if they do that, then these metal will become less in water column, which are already low in concentration. So less, but less nutrient. Yes, less nutrient. Phy phy phycoplankton will be a problem. Yes, so it will get affected for that. Phytoplankton. So, and this, but this interaction of metals with microplastic is not known. So we are trying to understand how this dissolved metal interacts with microplastics. And uh, you know how this micro, or in other way, how these microplastics affect uh, the mobility, bioavailability of these dissolved metals in marine environment. Yeah, so uh, you you developed some uh, technology or some process or uh, yes, that is that is based on my understanding of analytical chemistry. I developed the uh, you know protocol which I follow here and. Uh, Based on the and following that protocol, I try to understand the interactions and including different thermodynamic parameters and uh, and and try to understand now, those you microscopic. You said that you processes. made some patenting on on these particular. Those microplastic, yeah, that uh, patent we made how to remove microplastic from ballast water. Right. So ballast water is basically the water that we require for balancing the ship. Right. Now it's several metric. Uh, liters of uh, ballast water we always you know uh, put in sheep and uh, before and and uh, and all these ships wh while taking this ballast water we uh, made we made a device by which we can separate microplastic present in those ballast water so what will happen every day worldwide if everybody use this uh, technique then they will it is possible to remove these uh, uh, microplastics of and we are also separating them of different sizes and uh, you know can remove them from the last water and which uh, has been patented has not been commercialized yet but, but hopefully it is of great significance of no yeah hopefully it, it will work yeah i yes. also made something uh, uh, pre-concentration unit for mercury dissolved mercury because uh, it is extremely difficult to determine dissolved mercury. You really cannot determine dissolved mercury by uh, whatever the conventional in, in, in water column by conventional method. Because so of that very low, low concentration and pico molar or yes, that, yes, that range. Yes. yes. And also the salt content in seawater is very high. So you cannot really dilute it further because salt con content is so high. So I developed one small uh, pre-concentration unit um, that has not been uh, patented yet. Um, and uh, those, that pre-concentration unit is basically uh, help us to uh, pre-concentrate mercury and uh, then we can De determine, determine the, the amount mercury of mercury present in okay. uh, water column. So Patu, it's very inspiring yours particularly stories of your research and scientific pursuit. So let us know about your you know, school days. So right, tell um, us about that. I studied in Shiliguri Boys High School. And uh, my father was a headmaster in a higher secondary school in Bagdogra. Uh, you must be aware of the place, Bagdogra. And uh, my mother was a school teacher in Shiliguri itself. So, uh, I studied in Shiliguri Boys High School and since, uh, uh, you know, parents both were out every day, uh, means, you know, they were going to school. So, 
she my mother used to take me with her and you know asking her to sit there in her from very yes from even school kid. yes like, even when you are not going to school yes oh. yes and uh, then there was a primary school and uh, so when i became i think 5 i guess so at that time um, i was put in that primary school so i was studying there and uh, school used to get closed by uh, one o'clock or something like that then, to one. then it's in almost in the same campus so i used to stay with her in her office till four and then come back come back home so by that way i did my education there then moved to shiliguri boys high school which is a higher secondary school so i studied there till 12 and uh, then uh, was it a english medium or bengali no, no, medium no, school it's a, it's a government bengali medium school bengali. yes and uh, from there we i started studying chemistry honors uh, in shiliguri college which is under north bengal university and uh, then uh, after uh completing my bsc then i did my msc from north bengal university and uh, then uh, qualified get in that uh, in 2000 and then moved to uh cochin university of science and technology and then while doing my dissertation in uh, national chemical laboratory in pune in chemical engineering division uh, Um, I saw many people are applying for PhD. I also got offer uh, from NCL Pune at that time to join there as well as in IIT Kanpur. Um, but uh, also got few offer from Germany and then from Singapore, Ireland and Canada. And uh, during that time I was a bit confused. Uh, because this field was quite unknown to me uh, this chemical environmental sp- chemistry or you know, chemical it? speciation chemical and electrochemistry yeah. and uh, but i knew about uh, with, i learned something about my supervisor phd supervisor and um, uh, from uh, his uh, cv as well as from his uh, research articles even though though those things were not because the internet was not so popular at that time and, and uh, it was basically 2002 2002 yes yes and uh, so whatever the information that i received uh, uh, i i thought that i should go to canada and it was my brother who also advised uh, he told that you also believed in that that nothing can come from comfort zone so other subjects were known to me means you know i was of course phd is something much bigger than our understanding after msc or mtech uh, but this subject i felt that it has lot more applications means i can directly apply in many different ways so uh, he was keep telling me that you go and study here and then come back and establish this field in india and uh, and i think that was one of the best suggestion so uh, your brother was also is also a scientist no he is an economist and uh, where he, is he now he he is now asian development bank but he was the former director of national institute of public finance and policy He was also What's uh, his name? Pinaki Chakraborty. Oh. He was the uh, economic advisor of 14th Finance Commission. Uh, so then um, I decided to go to Canada and uh, and uh, and carry out uh, my uh, and I uh, you know work there uh, and, and uh, I spent a lot of time in the lab and uh, produce lot because it was a new field and I, it was lots of challenge for me so i started working and uh, uh, spend lot of time uh, in the lab to generate good set of data and uh, then uh, completed my phd and then moved to netherlands europe and worked with uh, a very renowned person herman van leeuwen uh, by the way my supervisor was professor cl chakraborty so parthu tell us uh, 
who are the most influential persons in your life other than your parents? I understand definitely right. your parents will be the most influential. Yes. Uh, my brother, uh, uh, basically he is the one, we are two and uh, he is eight years older than me. And uh, he always uh, encouraged me to do well in life, irrespective of subject like, you know, whether it is uh, academics or cricket or music, uh, all these uh, activities basically he influenced a lot because I, he was the one whom I followed. So definitely his influence uh, is uh, probably the most. And um, then uh, my teachers. And, uh, Several teachers during my BSc and MSc who influenced me a lot and, uh, and, uh, and that uh, basically uh, you know, helped me to go and their advice is. I, I could see that you know, your passion was in inorganic chemistry. Right. So, your teacher who teaches you in organic chemistry must be... Uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, it's not about like, you know, I started my, during my school time. Uh, I probably in Shiliguri Boys High School, I was the, I had chemistry, additional chemistry. At that time, 9, 10, you, we could take some additional subject. And, uh, and uh, I think there were two or three people who chose chemistry and I was one of them and uh, so it is because uh, one of my brother's friend he was teaching uh, chemistry and he was fantastic. So What's his name? Devashish Goshan. He is now he works now in LIC and uh, he is in somewhere I think in Kolkata we are in touch. But he, the way he taught was uh, something uh, extraordinary and that basically means I attracted to chemistry just because of him. And then uh, during my BSc, uh, Dr. Apurva Kumar Sarnal, Dr. Gaurango uh, they also, uh, you know, in their teaching uh, also influenced me a lot. And uh, I should not restrict to only to them. Yeah, I but, understand that. I but, understand. But yeah. There are many, many other uh, professors who also helped me a lot uh, to understand many different things in many different ways. Then during MSc, Professor Santosh Kumar Nath, uh, who was a very good friend of Professor Onimesh Chakraborty of Jadupur Cultivation, and uh, uh, Professor Pinati Bondopadhyay, uh, and uh, then. Uh, no, they, uh, Professor Basudev Basu, uh, they are not all from inorganic chemistry, and you know some of them are from organic chemistry, some of them from uh, inorganic chemistry. So their teaching uh, and you know uh, and, uh, that influenced me a lot, and um, and as a result, now I just do not work on inorganic chemistry. I work both organic, inorganic, physical together because you cannot really differentiate because it's so multidisciplinary subject where everything works together in in, in art science system so uh, i basically look at all these aspects together so uh, definitely all of them helped a lot and they influenced uh, a lot so tell me about your family okay uh, my wife uh, sucharita she uh, did her PhD from Goa University uh, when we were in Goa and uh, she sacrificed a lot uh, for me. She had an opportunity from Florida State University to carry out her PhD but uh, she declined that because we wanted to be in the same place. So, so we came to Vishakhapatnam then, uh, you know, we had some tough time there for many other reasons that um, we were together and professionally we had tough time and then uh, we moved to Goa so then she started her uh, research career 
completed her PhD from Goa University. When she completed it? It was in 2017. And uh, then she applied for research associateship in CSIR. She got that. And, uh, and uh, well, I means after starting her research associateship uh, in 2017, end of 2017, I moved in 2000, 2018, she started RH. And uh, then I moved to IIT Kharagpur. So she also moved, transferred her fellowship here, and uh, then completed that project. She was working here in geology department, and uh, then uh, pandemic started. Then, uh, but she is also geochemist. Uh, she is. Uh, she is a marine scientist. Yeah, marine scientist. Yeah. So in the same Yeah, very similar. She is. She is. My. She is also. She works on. Uh, isotopes and uh, and uh, also related to trace metals. Yes. And what about your kids? Uh, I have two sons, and uh, one is uh, 13 years old, and the younger one is five. So they have also the difference of eight years. Yeah. So they are studying here inside the campus. So because now you just moved. Only a few years ago. So, how are you finding this campus, or for you also, how are you finding this institute? Um, this institute, as I told you before, this institute is one of the best, according to me, and uh, I really enjoy working here. Um, since I was in Goa and uh, and spent ten years in Goa, uh, you know. Uh, I cannot really compare Goa and Kharagpur, means outside the campus. But inside the campus, it's fantastic. Means we really do not go outside much. And since we do not have anything outside, and... Uh, so it is good for you. What about your family? Do they like... <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> and which school they are studying? In DAV. DAV. Yes. Right. But, uh, yeah, sometimes we miss Goa because we cannot really go for a long drive or sea beach and uh, clean environment like you know that we used to get but we never had winter means you know uh, we never enjoyed winter and uh, after leaving Siliguri so uh, Kharagpur is providing the best uh, you know I, I could feel uh, six different seasons all flavors all season. flavors I can feel and that is not possible in Vizak or in Goa so that is the best part of Kharagpur. And another best thing is uh, I love to eat. And uh, Khejurir Gur, that you cannot get anywhere except uh, this Bengal. place. Yes, yeah. in Bengal. South Bengal particularly. And, uh, and <clears throat> uh, Kharagpur is, uh, Kharagpur IIT is uh, really good. Inside the campus is excellent. Yeah, so Parthu, it's, it's wonderful to interact with you. Thank you so and, much. And... Uh, uh, it's very inspiring story. The, the your childhood, I could see that a very you know studious boy. Of course, having many other like the normal Bengali boy, uh, you know, who has a lot of dreams. Groomed by the family, you know, who set the ideals. Your brother, wonderful person, and uh, did amazing job. So really, it's fantastic to, to know about your journey and your background. Uh, so for the, for the end of this no, program, we would like to listen some message from you to our viewers, particularly the young researchers. And, uh, All right. Yeah. Uh, my, I'm not very sure whether uh, I can convey. Uh, uh, means I'm good enough to convey this message but what I feel from my life is uh, uh, as I mentioned before as well uh, uh, anything that we want to do means something great can come only when we work out of the when we think out of the box and when we come out from the comfort from our comfort zone so if we come out from our comfort zone initially it may give lots of trouble lots of problems but eventually you know if we succeed um, that will give something really really different and fantastic things uh, you know that 
uh, probably is very important because uh, many people always think about um, uh, for uh, for their comfort for a very short span of time but you know that may not be uh, means if you want to do something extraordinary then you have to come out from comfort zone i am not claiming that i have uh, done something extraordinary but there are but i am always coming out from my comfort zone and trying and you, to do you, something you, different you want to do something very you know uh, rich or to do as you said that you no know, you want to understand this holistic process of yes. environmental interaction yes. of metal metals and natural ligands i mean yes. that is the primary focus of your research very focused yes again very encompassing right so uh, i'm sure you no know, that you no know, you are this environment uh, will give you more support Thank we you. are looking forward to your success and we would like to listen to your stories you no know, continuing stories in future programs also sure thank, thank you, you so much thank you thank you thank you